At some point, when you were a kid in school, you probably learned about Sir Isaac Newton, who developed a theory of gravity and eventually published his Principia, which was basically a mathematical description of how the universe worked. In school, I didn't really appreciate this stuff. And I don't think most people do, because we don't learn it in context. Which means we miss out, in this case, on a specific nuance of what made his publication of Principia, where he laid out his laws of physics, so beautiful and revolutionary. Which is that... It not only described a set of physical rules for gravity and motion that seemed to explain the movement of objects in elegantly simple equations, but those rules it laid out worked both down here on Earth, where we do stuff like throw apples to each other, and up there at the same time. It was by no means a given at this point that the rules didn't just change when you left Earth. If you think about the incredibly small amount of information we had about space and the celestial bodies, which was basically that they seemed to grind around in these heavenly circles, with a few of them doing their own weird paths, and we called those ones the planets. Stuff up there didn't seem to fall to Earth or bump into each other the way objects here do, and we didn't have any particular reason to assume that both operated by the same set of rules. Which is why creating a set of rules that worked both in terrestrial and celestial physics really required a creative genius. Newtonian laws unified terrestrial and celestial physics into what we now call classical physics. It's easy to take for granted what we now assume, that the rules are the same everywhere, and that we can figure them out. Since then, we've moved even further, with Einstein essentially coming along and thinking, well, what if space and time itself was, you know, bendy? And then it turned out it is, and now we've improved upon classical physics with relativity, which is cool because now the same theory can describe the path of the ball we're tossing and also predict the existence of black holes. But going back to Newton, we're now faced with a problem in modern physics very much like the situation Newton resolved in the first place. We can't come up with a set of rules that works here and also works here. Now we use a totally different set of rules to talk about things on the quantum level, quantum physics, and in the normal world, relativity. Quick aside, I'll link a video in the description where I talk a bit more about quantum physics consciousness and the many worlds interpretation. But back to the state of physics today. Resolving this division in physics would help us get a theory of everything, which is a term you've probably heard before, which is kind of the holy grail of physics. A single theory explaining all four fundamental forces and thereby describing the entire observable universe. This is what people like Stephen Wolfram are trying to figure out right now. Because... Here, things seem to happen that make no sense based on our rules of how everything was supposed to operate. Things can affect each other instantaneously at a distance, or even be in two places at once. But our theories explaining quantum physics basically don't account for gravity, and relativity works for big stuff but can't explain quantum behavior. Facing this problem with physics means we're at an unusually interesting place in human thought. Looking forward, there are two general possibilities. One is that we're due for another Newton-esque revolution in our scientific paradigm. This moment could be just on the cusp of a revolution that would give us elegant rules describing the universe in all three of these areas, one that would by necessity also transform our understanding of the things that we thought we had already figured out along the way. Maybe we're right in the cusp of someone coming up with a theory that cleanly resolves gravity on the quantum scale, leading to new understandings of the classical and the quantum world that may lead to rapid acceleration of our ability to harness the possibilities of spooky quantum behavior, quantum computers, or even teleportation, and this would almost certainly transform our most fundamental understanding of physical reality. The alternative is that we are not on the cusp of a new discovery, that we won't figure it out, which I think would make the situation just as interesting, maybe more interesting, because we're illuminating not just a conflict and a crisis in physics, but also in metaphysics. It could very well be that we don't find a resolution to this dilemma that is frustrating physicists now. This could be because the rules just do change at that level of size, and the reason for the changing has no explanation, or no explanation that is possibly intelligible to us. Maybe we'll never understand a why. It will just be what it is. And the universe is fundamentally not predictable and comprehensible with descriptive rules that are discoverable to a human mind. And if so, that could be okay. Remember, the universe doesn't owe it to us to be intelligible, let alone to appear elegant and consistent. Basically, since Newton, we've been on a pretty crushing streak based on the axiomatic assumption that the universe makes sense, which is to say that we can make sense of it, that everything is guided by the same simple equations, and we can understand and manipulate those equations. We just need to figure out what they are. It's anathema to our most basic fundamental beliefs about consciousness and how to interpret reality to even question that assumption. Even the presumption that we can participate in an attempt to interpret reality is embedded in how I naturally framed that point.
that the universe makes sense at all is actually not a given. We assume it does. And that has led to some pretty good outcomes. And the fact that that assumption even seems phenomenologically through the experience of consciousness to be true is an absolute wonder. There is no fundamental reason why the universe, which is to say, in this case, the experience of consciousness, because the existence of the objective universe is a presumption we make as a consequence of our conscious experience, should be anything other than random, frenetic, deluge of startlement, torturous suffering, and flashes of color. But phenomenologically, through some unearned grace, we don't experience it that way. There may be no better metaphor for existing as a conscious being than the moment when you walk into a room and forget why you came there. We just appeared in the universe one day, looked around, and thought, what the fuck was I supposed to do here again? We don't have any inherent access to metaphysical context outside of feeling like we exist. Yet, somehow, we can experience, even momentarily, beauty, joy, contentedness, purpose. If you believe there is no metaphysical predicate, like, you know, a benevolent god that requires the universe to be anything but agony for us, then the fact that the universe yields coherent, even at times positive experiences for consciousness, is a gift of incalculable value simply from randomness itself. It is literally a random occurrence that is the source of all that is good in your life. The essence of that being illusory versus absolute and objective is almost irrelevant. The only justifiable reaction to even the experience of any of those subjectively good things is not fairly described as gratitude, but maybe better as just wonder. And by my estimation, the greatest unearned phenomenological gift in the experience of consciousness may be the ability to hold and pretty effectively operate by the assumption that the universe has rules. And we are privileged enough to be able to understand them, whether that is objective or simply an illusion. We can and do function with the axiom that we are capable of unfurling the secrets behind the universe bit by bit, guided by a preference that is ultimately probably best described as aesthetic for more simple explanations that explain a wider range of phenomena, a preference that seems to work and allows us to more deeply understand and predict the universe in practical terms. This is how we end up in this process, coming up with beautiful and complicated models, describing how it all works, and then recognizing that those models are flawed and abandoning them for even more elegant solutions, like the beautiful, intricate, and flawed models of the geocentric solar system that we built on a mistaken assumption, but failed to square out with retrograde motion of planets, so we had to then build into that system these little loops called epicycles to make these planetary orbits look like these petaled formations creating this incredible, inexplicable idea of how the celestial bodies all move together. And then we threw it out to replace it with the heliocentric models that are more simple and more elegantly describe the same motion that we observed in the skies. This is the game that we get to play. And so far, it just keeps working. How many of our current assumptions are like this? What stuff that we believe are today's epicycles? Is dark matter, invisible matter that basically interacts only gravitationally really the most elegant solution for explaining galaxy clustering that doesn't make sense to us? For our predictions to make sense based on all the matter we see, we would be way off. So we assume that we're right about how the universe works, but 85% of the matter in it is just invisible. Well, what about dark energy? A magical invisible force that makes the universe get larger to account for how wrong our estimation would be otherwise for the rate at which it's expanding. We know our physics, our entire model of the universe is almost definitely wrong. It always has been and almost definitely always will be. But the fact that it seems to get better, that there is even a direction for it to go, or at least we feel like there is, might be the most wonderful thing in the phenomenological universe. But it's important to remember, the universe owes us nothing, and it doesn't have to be intelligible. And I'm going to keep making these every couple weeks, so definitely subscribe down in the corner and let me know if you have any topics that you think are interesting.